Hello. You're listening to One Voice Makes a Difference, a place where people can tell their stories of how God's voice made a difference in their life. We pray you will be inspired and encouraged by today's episode. Now, here's your host, Janet Swanson. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to One Voice Makes a Difference. We have a special guest for you today, and I am so excited about this lady, this powerful woman of God. Her name is Janet Boynes, and Janet Boynes founded Janet Boynes Ministries in Maple Grove, Minnesota in 2006. She authored the books called out A Former Lesbian Discover of Freedom, God and Sexuality, and her latest book, God and the LGBT Community. She challenges individuals and the church to reach out with a message of hope and restoration to those who struggle with identity issues. Her life is a proof that the love of God has the power to heal and restore the brokenness in our lives. It's been over 20 years since she was called out of the lesbian lifestyle. Janet is an ordained minister under the Assemblies of God and travels the U.S. and overseas, sharing a message of redemption. Her desire is to bring hope through the power of Jesus Christ. Oh, that's powerful. Thank you, Janet Boynes, for being here with us today. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for having me. It's not even a coincidence that both of our names are Janet. I know. Isn't that cool? (laughs) I love that. It is pretty cool. (laughs) Well, I have been hearing so much about you. I have listened to you on podcasts. I've been looking at your YouTube channel and um, I'm so inspired by your story and I cannot wait just to get your story out there to everyone that's listening, that the whole world can hear what God has done in your life and the transformation that has taken place. And so first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, how did your past play a role in your decision to become a lesbian in the first place? You know, it, every body has a different story. You know, my story is different from everybody else's story. However, for me, my life was traumatic and being raised in a family of seven kids with four different fathers and watching the man that raised me who fathered the three under me Um, He was very abusive with my mother. He was an alcoholic. And when you're growing up as a child and you're watching a man who was supposed to protect you and protect your mother, abuse her, you know, your life started, my life was being shaped by my early experiences. Mm -hmm. And so with that being said, I thought, okay, my parents are fighting that's the way you handle your problem. So I went to school and started beating up all the kids because I thought, you know, if somebody says something mean to me or, you know, if things don't work out according to my plan, then I'm supposed to beat everybody up. And so I was mimicking what I saw at home. I was cussing people out and getting kicked out of school and, you know, getting blamed for everything that, you know, was happening in my home. Everybody just thought I was a bad person. I wasn't a bad person. It's just bad things were starting to happen to me at home. Mm -hmm. And as I was being raised, even though we had four different fathers among the seven kids, I would follow my oldest sisters down to her dad's house, who was still married to my mother, even though they didn't live together. And in this one particular time, I'll never forget it, even though he passed away many in back in 1999, he sent my oldest sister and my youngest sister to the store and he raped me. And that's when I realized that, you know, maybe this isn't something that I want. Maybe I don't want to be in a relationship, you know, with a man. But during that time, I was accused of already being a lesbian because I used to play basketball. I played with the guys. I was just enjoying life as a child. And a lot of times we put post-it notes, as I will say, onto children, onto people because they're trying to enjoy life. They're trying to find out who they are. You know, their identity is not in the sport, but they're just growing into, you know, maturity and puberty. And a lot of people started accusing me of being a lesbian. And so as time went on, I was going to prove them wrong. So I went to the prom. I was very involved in, you know, having a boyfriend, bringing him over to the house. But Janet, I'll never forget the day when I really 
started to understand homosexuality, we were preparing for church. And my mom was a no-nonsense kind of woman. And there was a knock at the door and a good friend of hers came to her and said, you know, last night I saw your son, Robert. He called himself Barbara. So what we found out is that my oldest brother was cross-dressing. He was Barbara at night, but he was Robert during the day. We never saw him dressed up as a woman, which they called back in my era, a drag queen. Right. You know, today they call it transgender. No, they just renamed it. Right. Back in my era, they call somebody like me a dyke. You know, today they call him a lesbian. Right. You know, so, you know, back then a transgender today was just cross-dressing. Somebody who really wanted to um, that was born a man, but now is dressing as a woman. So my life continued on and I continue getting in trouble. However, that was not the time that I made a decision be to become a lesbian. Wow. That's, that's amazing. You know, um, in, in my life too, I have a cousin that he was a macho man. Like when I say macho, he didn't, he was married, had kids. And then all of a sudden after 30 years of being married, he leaves his wife and starts doing the same exact thing. And you wonder what in the world is going on. I think somewhere along the line, the enemy labels us and we believe that lie. Don't you think? So did you feel like you we do that lie also about yourself? I, I really didn't know who I am. And to be honest with you, I'm 63 years old and I'm still trying to find out who I am. Right. You know, we can get into that later, but my identity was always in trying to prove myself to my mother, trying to live up to her expectations, either even though my mother wasn't educated. My mother passed away almost two years ago, coming up in February. I was very close to my mother coming down the stress the last 10, 15 years. But mm -hmm. still, my mother had very high expectations, even though she was illiterate and she couldn't read and she wasn't educated she still had high expectations. There's a certain way we had to do things at home. We couldn't do what all the other kids could do. We couldn't talk back. We couldn't share and express our feelings. So all that um, anger and frustration, I internalized it. And I started getting high. I started smoking cigarettes. I started getting in trouble and getting kicked out of school. That was the way I was starting to medicate my pain and cry for help. But when you know better, you do better. Right. And my mother didn't know any better. She wasn't educated. She didn't understand how to raise children back in the 60s and 70s, right. <laughs> you know, because her mother wasn't that educated. So a lot of times those of us that are kids, we hold our parents responsible mm -hmm. for something that they weren't able to give to us. And we keep looking for that from our family, which I get it because mm -hmm. all the way up until my mother's death, Janet, I still was looking for um, her to affirm me, for her to reach out and, and love me, even though I know she loved me, she mm -hmm. wasn't able to give me something that she never got. And wow. that was difficult for me. Wow. That's powerful. So you, you found yourself going to the prom and then you found yourself at the altar about to get married. Tell us a little bit about that. Isn't that crazy? You know, in 1985, you know, I was in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I lived in Arstown, Pennsylvania, right outside of Philadelphia. And in what year I graduate in 76 and 1979, I moved to Minneapolis, Minnesota with my eighth grade English teacher and her husband. She literally took me under her wing, the worst kid in the school. She was determined to, to help me and make something of me. And she was really the only mom figure I really had that I really knew I could go to somebody and depend on them. And so I went on to college and then I left Cheney University and went on to Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I was at Concordia College, was like a Christian Lutheran school. And some girl came up to me. It's, I wish I could find her today to show her what my life is like. But she invited me to church. And I said, yes. And I went to church. And in 1980, 81, I gave my heart to the Lord. And I met this awesome guy. And I've always had something, you know, in my heart that I would ne never marry a Black man. And the reason why I said that at that time is because I associated black men with abuse and rape because that's all I knew. Right. I didn't think Caucasian men or Indian men or Hispanic men did that type of thing. I just knew only black men abuse wow. and rape people. So I didn't want to be involved with a 
a person of of my color. So I met this wonderful guy and we he courted me for three years and and asked me to marry him. And it's so funny because I went home, you know, sharing with my family about this awesome guy and the newfound faith that I had. And my family was ecstatic. They were so excited for me, mm-hmm. you know, and during that time that I was home, my brother who was living a homosexual life, you know, told me that he had the virus and I didn't think any more about it. I just went on about my business. I knew he was going to be okay. He said he wasn't going to die. So I went back to Minneapolis, Minnesota wow. and started spending time with this woman at my job. And I never forget when my fiance said to me, you know, Janet, don't you think you're spending too much time with that girl? And I looked at him and thought, no, you know, just a friendship. But I didn't know that she was, I was a target for her. Yeah. that she was interested in me. And I wind up spending, you know, some time at her home. And one night I spent the night and we got into a sexual relationship. Wow. Three months before I was supposed to walk down the aisle. Wow. So how did you walk away from your fiance? You know, the next day, I never want to ever experience what I felt. I could literally feel the Holy Spirit just leave me. I had a very close walk with the Lord Mm -hmm. back in 1985. I really felt like I knew him. And Mm -hmm. all of a sudden it felt like the Holy Spirit disappeared. It was gone. So Mm -hmm. I went to my pastor and he was under the Assemblies of God church at that time. And I told him I had a sexual relationship with this woman last night. Mm -hmm. I was panicking and he told me three things. And only if Pastor Tedeschi, he knows now back then that he told me the right things. Call off your wedding tell your fiance and get some help. I told my fiance and I called off my wedding and I walked away from the Lord during that time to embark on a new journey in a homosexual relationship with this woman that I fell into a sexual relationship with. So how long did you stay in that lifestyle and what brought you out of it? I lived that lifestyle. It is, it's amazing when the Bible says that, you know, there's a hundred sheep and one go astray. God never left me. I could always sense the presence of God. He would always put things in my path to show me that he was near. And I do did my best to try to ignore him. And I used to shake my finger at God and say, stop it. I'm right. not coming back. But if you want me, you catch me. If you can catch me, I'll come back. I, might, I literally used to say that. And my friends used to say in the bar that I would always talk about God whenever I started drinking. And, you know, Jeremiah says, you know, whatever's inside of you is going to come out. I'm paraphrasing. It was in my bones. You know, I was, yeah. with, you know, a lot of the word of God. And they said, I used to tell them, number one thing, if we're never around, if I'm never around you, never get the mark of the beast. And they said, I used to say that all the time, you know, never get that mark of the beast, you know, because right. you'll go to hell. <laughs> but during that time, as the Lord was working on my heart, there was a church right down the street from me years later, literally 14 years later, I would go past on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. And actually I was blinded to that church for a very long time until one day God really illuminated that church. And I used to tell my girlfriend, I'm going to go to that church someday and I'm going to write a book and I'm going to travel the world. And literally she would look at me like, what are you talking about? And wow. I would think, what do you mean? What are you talking about? You know, I go, I don't know what I'm going to write about. I just Felt like I was going to say it, but it, literally it would come out of my mouth. And five years later, I had my own cleaning business and three o'clock in the morning, I went to the store because I used to um, oversee the cardio for one of the lifetime fitness in Plymouth, Minnesota. And I told my staff of seven, I'm going to the store. And I ran into a woman. She was coming out with all these groceries. I was going in and we engaged in a lo- conversation. You know, like, ma'am, you're out here three o'clock in the morning. Don't you know somebody can rape you and steal your purse and all these groceries? It doesn't make sense. That tells you I'm a compassionate and caring person. I care about everybody. Some days I wish I didn't, Mm -hmm. but that's the way I'm wired. And she said, no, I just dropped my son off at school. I said, ma'am, I'm not going to hurt you. There's no school open three o'clock in the morning. And she said, oh, my son. He's in college. I dropped him off at his dorm. My husband and I are going away and, you know, we have four boys. And so we want to make sure the refrigerator is filled. I said, well, what school is open three o'clock in the morning? She said, oh, North Central Bible College. And then the wheels started turning because I took homiletics and hermeneutics at North Central. So I was very familiar with it. And then I realized 
she's a Christian. And so we started talking about God and I told her I walked away from God and I started just sharing how I was going to get married and she invited me to church. And when she said, will you come to church with me two weeks later? I said, sure. And she pulled out a brochure and she wrote her phone number on it. And when I looked at it, it was the church down the street from me, Maple Grove Assemblies of God. Two weeks later, I went to her church and rededicated my heart to the Lord. Oh my gosh, that just gave me chill bumps at three o'clock in the morning. Who can figure that? Three o'clock in the morning. Talk about divine. God can do all things. Yes, divine appointments that you didn't. That was divine. You walked right. Had no idea. Oh my gosh, it's like the Lord allowed you to go a certain way, but His presence never left you. You could feel Him everywhere. As in the book of Hebrews, He says He's all in all. He is. He is everywhere. And, and the word says he never leaves us or forsakes us, but sometimes we walk away when we walk away from the faith, that's where you feel that, that separation, you know? So there there was a separation, you know, when you go into sin and I know, you know, that as a pastor is that there is a separation, you know, you can't serve two masters. God will have no part in sin you know, mm-hmm. goes against everything he believes and what he stands for. Mm-hmm. However, I knew what I was doing was wrong. I knew I wasn't born that way, mm-hmm. but sin is fun for a season. For mm-hmm. me, I didn't want God at that time. I was enjoying life. I was getting attention that I never got as a child. I had drugs, I had a girlfriend, I had a home. I had everything that I wanted. So why would I want God? You know, I've I'm yeah. finally getting the attention and the guy that I was going to marry, not that he didn't love me, but he was always on the road. He was a professional bike racer. He was a drummer. He didn't spend the time with me that he should have been spending with me so we can build upon, you know, our relationship and keep drawing closer. But other things was important, even though he apologized later, you know, years later, you know, at that time, he didn't know any better and neither did I. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. You know, Jana, I was a hairdresser for 30 something years. I just retired two or three years ago, but I've had a lot of conversations with people throughout the years. And one of the number one conversations that we would have, because they would bring up all kinds of stuff. My chair was like a counseling chair, right? And this conversation came up all the time that, Hey, people are born gay. They can't help it. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they can't help who they are. So what do you have to say about that? Because in Psalm 139, God says we're fearfully and wonderfully made and God doesn't make mistakes when he makes us. So how, what do you have to say about that? And, and how did the enemy twist that to make people believe, Hey, I'm born like this. Right. You know, in Jeremiah 1, 5, you know, it says that we are, you know, God ordained us in the womb. He knit us together every back of us, God created. So when you're in the womb, how can we say that God made a mistake, you know, when your mother had you as a male or a female, right. there's only two genders and I, let's not get it twisted. You know, there's on Facebook, if you Google genders, you'll see about 50 to a hundred genders. Wow. I only know two and that's male or female. Yeah. And we can go back to the beginning of times and, and look in Genesis when God created you know, Adam and and Eve. And I really believe, and when he said, you know, a father, you know, shall leave their, a man shall leave their, their father and mother and plead to a wife. I really believe, and they shall become one. I really believe that God's smart enough, wise enough, and sharp enough to say, you know what? And we're going to have homosexual marriage. We're going to have homosexual relationships. And so Satan takes, just like in the garden, when, um, Eve ate the apple. Did God really say? And so that's what Satan is is supposed to do. He's doing his job and he's doing it very well. The problem is we're not doing our job. Mm-hmm. And what happens, just like the rainbow, God created the rainbow for a reason. He will never, you know, end the world by water again. We know why the rainbow was put there, but the enemy took the rainbow and twisted it. You right. know, so now a lot of Christians won't even you know, show the rainbow or wear rainbow colors because it's associated and affiliated with homosexuality. Well, Mm -hmm. I'm going to wear a rainbow and talk about the rainbow until the cows come home because that's a counterfeit what they're doing. 
Satan will do everything as a counterfeit. He doesn't like God. He has no redemption. He knows where he headed. So why not take a lot of people with them? You know, we all were born of sin. Every last one of us. Right. We have an opportunity as we get older to determine, you know, if we're going to live for Christ or not. We all will have an opportunity to to be introduced to Jesus, right. our Lord, God and Savior. You know, and so you either going to choose life or death or blessings or curses. Right. And we get to choose life. But in the word of God, which is our manual, people can be deceived because they're listening more to the world's view than to God's view. Right. We were talking earlier about families who, you know, um, their child is living a homosexual life and, and children are giving their parents an ultimatum. Look, mom, dad, you either support me, you love my, my girlfriend or my boyfriend or my same sex partner, or I'm going to go away and you're not going to hear from me again. You're not going to hear from your grandkids. Well, wait a minute. We're supposed to love the Lord thy God with all our heart, strength, our might. Jesus is first. God is first. Amen. Everything else falls under that. What we forget is that God is omnipresent, all knowing. He can get to our children, our spouse, our relatives, our kids before we can. He can see everything. Mm -hmm. And what we're not doing is putting our faith and our trust in God. What we're trying to do is play God Jr. We're trying to save our kids and we don't even have anything close to being able to save our kids. The only one who can save them is Jesus. The other point I want to make very clear to parents out there that are listening is that God loves your children far more than you could ever love them. Mm. And if you give him the opportunity and trust him, I believe your child will come back because we need to let them hit their bottom. Now, if a child commits suicide or, or, or say, you know, I'm going to commit suicide, you know what I would do as a parent, even though I'm not a parent and we have dealt with this many times, I would call the authorities and have them put in a place if they're 18 and under where they're going to get the best help that they can. They right. might not like it and they might go kicking and screaming, but it's still your responsibility to get them the help that they need when they become an adult, you know, things are differently. They are out there on their own and they get to make decisions. For me, I went through a lot of traumatic experiences. I didn't want to live either. Matter of fact, going through the pandemic, you know, a year ago, my mother died. I didn't want to live. I literally wanted to commit suicide. I felt like I was all by myself. Mm -hmm. Even though I had no desire to do that, I felt like nobody loved me. Nobody cared about me. And if I died tomorrow, they probably would care less. But mm -hmm. I knew that was a lie from the pit of hell. Yeah. And I took time to now reach out for help mm -hmm. because I really went to a dark place. And that's what we really need to do. But parents are trying to handle this situation all by themselves. They're afraid to trust God and Satan has them just where he wants them is to lean on their own understanding. Mm -hmm. And now their child, their child has pulled them into a life that contradicts the word of God. You know, I believe that when we expand experience, um, trauma, or even death, it's, it's like, we're so vulnerable in those moments that the enemy comes in and really attacks us and tries to twist God's word and, and put the blame on something somewhere, somehow. And you know what I've seen, I've seen most homosexuals now they've, they, um, are depressed. They've had a lot of suicide thoughts, suicidal thoughts, or they attempt suicide and they're, um, they're just, they're unsatisfied, but yet they still are, you know, leaning into this lifestyle. Why is that? Why do you think, or are they become alcoholics? They come addicted to drugs. What is that agenda? Janet, I did the same thing. They're not satisfied. You know, the Bible talks about you drink from his cup. You'll never thirst. Yeah. And when I was in the world and many of those that are out there and living a life of homosexuality, we continuously search to fill emptiness, fill a void. I'm not sure. I'm sure you know this, but there are so many um, Christians that walked away from their faith. Mm -hmm. There's more Christians walking their faith going into the homosexual life than there are those that are coming out. You know, something came out recently, nearly 40 percent of U.S. Gen Z's. 30% of young Christians identify as LGBTQ, polls said. And this came out in 10-20-21. That's Newsweek. 
And you can find that on my fan page and Jenna Boyne's Ministries fan page on Facebook. Um, but you have those that are searching to fill a void. They go to alcohol, they go to drugs, they go to same sex relationship, they go from relationship to relationship. And people are saying, well, heterosexuals do that too. We're not talking about heterosexuals, we're talking about lesbians and, and gays. They're always looking to fill that emptiness and fill that void. And once you knew, Christ as your Lord, God, and Savior, nothing will be able to replace that. You will never find peace. You'll never find happiness until we come back to Jesus. He is the center of our universe, and Satan is doing what he does best. He's a liar, he's a thief, and he's a counterfeit. And everybody are starting to drink the water because they're afraid to go up against the gay community. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to be arrogant in any way. But as long as I'm on planet Earth, I will fight to get our children back mm -hmm. to where they belong. And that's in the hands of God. That's their safest place. Wow. And let me say this, too. One of my board members who helped me write the book, Janet and Tim Distel, um, their daughter is now five years of coming out of their life. And this is what she said to them. And parents, I want you to hear this. And I want you to hear this loud and clear. And if you want to talk with them, you email my ministry, info at JanetPointsMinistries.com, and I will get you in touch with them. Their daughter said to them, mom, dad, you trained us up in the ways and the admiration of the Lord. If you would have supported my gayness, or my lesbianness, or my girlfriend allowed us to come over, why would I believe the word of God? You wow. went against everything that you taught us based on biblical principles. So if you're not going to believe it, why should we believe it? Mm. And that was something that really stuck with me is that parents, if you stay true to the word of God, and you let your children know that you love them, you will always love them, as for me and my house, minister of the Lord, you are always welcome in this house, but you are not welcome in this house with your same sex partner. Let me tell you why. It is because you will not allow pornography in your home. You will not allow your heterosexual child to sleep with their partner if they're not married in your home. Mm -hmm. You will not allow drugs and alcohol in your home. Right. Homosexuality is a sin, but you allow two same sex partners in your home when it goes against biblical principles. I have a problem with that. Right. It's like the parent needs to create those boundaries. And I think what happens a go. lot of time, they're fearful. So they're like, oh, I, I would rather have my child with me and embrace their lifestyle rather than trust God and the Holy Spirit to be powerful in your prayers. Like when we pray for them, it changes things. Prayer changes things and believing that God will do what he said we, he would do and that he would answer our prayers. So as a parent, I think sometimes, like you said, we want to be Holy Spirit junior and try to change them, them ourselves or just embrace the, the lifestyle and let them live whatever life they want out of fear because we don't want to lose them. So uh, I'm so glad you gave us that advice. And I hope that really helps someone right now, because I really feel like there's people out there that don't know how to uh, connect with their children anymore because anything goes now. Right. Yeah. And even yeah, in my book, go ahead, Janet. Oh, go ahead. You can go in and tell me what you're going to say. Oh, in my book, um, my newest book, God in the LGBT community. Um, we talk about a lot of those things. The book before that, God and Sexuality, they're the same book, except for the newest book has a study guide onto it. We changed the title, the publisher, and they um, changed the cover. So they're the same book. However, we talk about if your child is going to have a civil union. I want to speak to the parents out there. There's many parents whose child is having a civil union, which the world calls marriage. I will never call it a marriage because the Bible says marriage is between a man and a woman. I know the gay community don't like when we call it a civil union. I know they wanna be accepted. I know they wanna be loved and I love them because I have a lot of gays and lesbians contact me and always encourage me to keep doing what I'm doing because one day they're gonna call on me and ask for help to come out of this. Mm -hmm. But let me say this in that book, if your child is going to have a civil union in my book, God in the LGBT community or God in sexuality, we talk about the steps that you need to take if your child wants to invite you to the wedding or if you could 
should consider going? Should you consider giving a gift or should you consider um, attending or going to the, you know, shower or the dinner? My answer is no, but we explain all that in my book. And I think it'd be very beneficial and helpful. A lot of times people want to call me and say, what should I do? But, you know, we wrote that book so you can become a lot more knowledgeable. So go to Amazon, get the book or go to my website, you know, Janet Points Ministries and order the book because I know it's going to be helpful. Oh, it is. It's already helping me right now because I can't tell you how many people have said to me, I mean, what can I do? Can I change them? I want to love my sister right. or I want to love my brother. Right. And I, if they're getting married, then I'm, I'm going to go because I don't support their lifestyle. But what do you do? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I don't want the relationship to be severed either. So uh, mm-hmm. that's very powerful. You guys, you need to go to Amazon or to her ministry website. You need to get this book because I think we as the church also need to know how to embrace. What would you say to pastors and leaders right now? How can we reach those that are, are tempted to live that lifestyle or are living that lifestyle right now, what can we do as the church to, to reach out to them and to help them? Mm -hmm. You know, I think you said something powerful is that, you know, we want to love them and the gay community feels as though if we don't support their worldview, if we don't go into a bar with them, if we don't allow their same sex partner to come over our house, if we don't go to their parties, we don't love them, but that's not love. You know, love is being honest and truthful with people. And I believe in our attempt to be honest and truthful and our delivery on how we deliver that message to them. I think, you know, the love of God will draw one to repentance. When we're talking to pastors and ministry leaders, which I get an opportunity to minister behind the scenes a lot of time to a lot of the staff is that they're looking for ways to reach the gay community. I know this is going to sound different, but Why do we feel like we need to go out there and reach them? I think God can bring them to us. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times we want to try to save, you know, the gay community or want to try to save, you know, our alcoholic brother. You know, once they have the word in their heart, I believe that the word never comes back void. And I believe God is very capable of tapping into that. However, we have gays and lesbians in our churches. We have transgenders in our churches. And the best thing we can do is let them be. If we're preaching the word of God and we say, and we're saying that the word of God is powerful and sharper than a two edged sword and it pierces the heart of the marrow, hey, it will do it. You know, right. if they're yeah. under the word of God, their lives are going to change. They're either going to change or they're not going to change. Mm-hmm. You know, we're, we're spirit, soul, and body. We have strong wills, you know, but I believe God can break through that. But it's really up to the individual if they want to change. Now, if you have a transgender at your church, you want to make sure that you have a bathroom, a designated bathroom, you know, apart from women's and male bathroom, because a lot of times men that come in that are dressed like women or girls that are dressed like men, they feel as though that they can go into that bathroom, even though biologically they weren't born, you know, into a man or born a woman, you got to make sure there's another bathroom designated for them because a lot of times they will creep into the bathroom when nobody is looking. And now you have a young child who mom allowed to go into the bathroom and they see this guy who didn't have gender reassignment surgery and he's standing up going to the bathroom and she's trying to figure out, well, it looks like a woman. What is going on here? And that brings confusion to our child. The other thing I think is important, if you see somebody that is being affectionate, that's a gay or a lesbian in the church, you know, don't address them in front of everybody. I think the best thing to do is call a meeting, never do the meeting by yourself, you know, because it's going to be your word against their word, but have a meeting, invite them into the office and let them know that you want them to come to church and you love them. However, you know, we want to make sure that boundaries are set that, you know, being affectionate, you know, to a same sex couple is just for us is not appropriate. You right. know, you got to set the boundaries. And if you set those boundaries right up front, they either are going to stay or they're going to go. And a lot of times they will stay and then sometimes they go. But I found that a lot of times they will stay at the church and they will respect the boundaries. Do you do you think somewhere deep down inside of the, their heart, they know that it's wrong? I really do. I really do. They do know it's wrong. But even Janet, when I was in that life, I dressed as a man. I shopped at Macy's men's department. I'll never forget the day when um, 
I really wanted to buy women's clothing. I didn't know how to do that. So mm-hmm. I always felt myself going back to where I was comfortable. Mm-hmm. And I think those that are living that life, they're doing what's comfortable for them. Coming out of the life of homosexuality is not easy. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was harder for me to lead that life than it was for me to get off of cocaine, wow. you know, back in 1989 when I put myself in treatment. Wow. And it's, it's just something like a draw that draws you back to that. Because, you know, when you have sex with somebody, you become one with them. Mm-hmm. You know, I haven't been in a heterosexual relationship <laughs> since I came out of that life in 1998. Mm-hmm. I'm still learning how to have a relationship. I would like to, you know, get married someday. And I don't think I'll be having kids at this time in my life at 63. Mm-hmm. But for some reason, God still has me single. I respect that and looking forward to the day that I meet that right one. But I am now comfortable in being feminine. I'm comfortable with being a female because it was something that I worked towards for the last 20 years. But if you haven't done that, you know, you're comfortable in your own skin, just like you'll find men that um, still dress as a woman or women that still dress as a men. Sometimes you'll see them in church and women will have walls in their back pocket. They don't want to carry a purse, but that doesn't mean they're not Christians. That doesn't mean that, you know, they don't love God. That doesn't mean they're not reading the Bible. Sometimes their outer appearance does not match what's going on inside. Mm. They are born again, spirit filled. They're not having sex anymore. Just their outer appearance don't look the way we think it should based on how they were born. And let me say this, don't judge a book by its cover. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of men and women who no longer live a life of homosexuality, Mm -hmm. men that still look like a woman, men that still have breasts. I want to start a foundation where I could help people that come to my ministry and say, will you help me? I have breasts. I'm no longer, you know, out there in the world. I'm not having sex. I'm serving God, but I want to feel like a man again, or women who would like to have breasts added, who have them removed. I want to feel like a woman again. You know, this is where we need to help them. So they don't feel like awkward. You you know what I mean? So I think you have a lot of work to do. There's no hope, but there is hope through the power yes. of Jesus Christ. Because I think if you've had surgery to change it and then God changes your heart, the enemy, I could see him coming in saying, hey, there's no hope. None of this can change. You've already changed it. So don't even think about it. But there is yeah. hope. You can there change is hope. Back. And God okay. is still working <laughs> miracles. I was reading in the book of John today. I think it was John 2, the very end of the chapter about how God was performing miracles signs Mm. and wonders and people's hearts were being changed and transformed and turned back to God. Mm -hmm. And and so God can do that. There's nothing too hard for God at all. Um, Mm -hmm. Well, he does work on the, you know, a lot of times we're looking for God to, you know, change the things on outer appearance, but God works on the heart first. Mm -hmm. You know, he works on that person out there that you think God's not doing anything. God is working day and night on that person that is backslid. Don't let the enemy trick you. I was out there 14 years and God at that time was a nuisance. Mm. (laughs) You know, I mean, I always felt his presence. I knew he was there. I knew he was putting things in front of me so I wouldn't forget him. Mm -hmm. God is awesome in that way. And that's what people don't realize when you backslide. God never will leave you or forsake you. He's right there trying Mm -hmm. to win you back. You know, it just came to my mind. There's a man in our community. He's he's a pastor preacher here. He wrote a song called uh, From the Inside Out. Lord, change my life from the inside out. Lord, change me. And that just came to me because that's what God that's beautiful. does. It works from the he works from the inside out. And I think a lot of times yeah. Christians want I want to sit on the outside first. I want to see the transformation take place, but God is at work doing a transformation mm-hmm. on the inside. He's forming and shaping our hearts. And I think that's so, um, so powerful how God does that. He always looks at the heart. You know, Jana, I think there may be someone right now that is struggling with the homosexual lifestyle. <laughs> They don't know what to do. They're, they're being pulled by the world. They're being pulled by their friends Mm -hmm. and they're actually thinking about going into that lifestyle, or maybe they've already slipped into it a little bit. What would you have to say to them right now? 
Well, you know, it's funny that you asked that. There's a youth pastor that contacted me yesterday out of Florida asking that same question. We're going to start talking about homosexuality in our church. We have so many Gen Zs and millennials that are struggling. You know, some of them want to feel a part of the gay community. They think that's the, the it thing, but you don't realize that the enemy will pull you into a life that is going to be very difficult and very dark. A lot of people think is accepting, you know what, there's only 5% of, you know, the population that is living a gay and lesbian life and behind the scenes, you just don't know they're miserable. Mm -hmm. They want out. And sometimes it's hard to leave something like drugs. When you enter into it, don't listen to the lie. You are as beautiful as God made you from the, from the time you came out of your mother's womb, Mm -hmm. but let me help you. Let us help you at Janet Pointe's Ministries. We will love you. We will try to get you the best help that we can. Even if you just want to talk about it, you're not ready. Let us come alongside of you. There's an outlet. Just go to our website, you mm-hmm. know, Janet Pointe's Ministries, or email us, info at JanetPointe'sMinistries.com. And we want to be there for you. Parents, we have parents who can talk with you. Our book will help you. You don't have to cave to the, the enemy's tactic and his lies. God loves your child far more than you do. And he's out there working behind the scenes. Trust that we will do whatever we can to help you. So contact us and, you know, give us an opportunity to do that. Amen. You guys, I'm telling you, you're listening today. I need you to share this podcast. If you know, this is going to help somebody let's share this podcast. Let's get this word out. And um, maybe you're listening right now and you know someone or maybe you yourself, you've been struggling with this. You don't know what to do. Reach out for help. And, and God is with you. And I know that you want him or you wouldn't be listening to this even right now. I know that you're thinking about coming back. And, and Janet, I want to ask you this, this one last question, because we got to wrap it up in just a few minutes. But maybe this person is thinking about, okay, I've been pulled, I've been living this lifestyle, but I'm ready to come out, but I don't know how, how, how do I become transformed now? And and we've already said that the transformation has to take place first on the inside and then the Mm -hmm. outside catches up later. But what would be the first step? Because like you said, it's really hard. And I've talked with other people too. It's really, really hard to uh, switch, switch it off like that and come, you know, break up with my friends, break up with all these people that I've been hanging out with. How do I do that? Mm -hmm. You know, for me, you know, that, that is a really good question, Janet. And that's one of the questions we get very often, but whenever somebody wants to leave the life of homosexuality, I think that it has to be designed based on your needs and what's important to you. But one thing I wanna make very clear that has to be done is that when you walk away from one community, you have to build another community. Mm. And I think that's really important. And that's what the church doesn't realize is that we wanna get you involved. We wanna get you volunteering. You know, we wanna get a mentor you know, that's going to contact you and spend time with you. We want to find a family that you can go visit maybe on Sunday afternoons and and hang out with them and their kids, you know, so somebody can just give you the love and attention that I really believe that you need. So I think that's the first step. Is that what happened to you with the lady in the, the parking lot? Did she take you under her wing? You know, we didn't get to this part, but in my book, um, called out, um, that came out in 2009 when I was at Maple Grove Assemblies of God, I got involved in a women's Bible study and I didn't know what I was going into when Tammy called me and said, Hey, there's a Bible study at church. Why don't you go? You know, the leaders know that you will be coming. It, it was a small office. It was for 10 women. And that spot was open for a very long time. Well, when I went to this meeting, I had to scarf around my head. I had working clothes on because I was going to go clean after that. Remember, I'm living a homosexual life. So I didn't really know what to expect. My girlfriend still lived at the house during that time. So I went to this Bible study. And when I got there, these women were dressed to the nines. Oh, they had their Louis Vuitton purses. Their hair was done, their nails. And I thought, oh my gosh. And I started backing out and my feet would not move. I felt like I was in like cinder blocks or something was gluing my feet to the ground, but I could move forward. So I went in and sat down. There was two leaders at that time, two women. They noticed that I was there. They were expecting me. They didn't know I was going to show up. 
And once they noticed, they all sat down and we went around the circle like I was in an AA meeting and they asked my, me my name. And I said, my name is Janet and I'm living a homosexual life. But if you help me, I'll serve the Lord the rest of my life. Three weeks later, one of the leaders came to me and said, hey, Janet, we've been praying for you. My husband and I, my three kids, we'd like you to move in with us. So at the age of 40, I sold my home and I moved in with a Christian family. And that was the beginning of what got me here today because I started having a better understanding how a husband should treat his life, what a family life was like. Remember, I grew up an alcoholic family. It was dysfunctional. I didn't know what it was like to love my brothers and my sisters and the family. I didn't have that. But this family set me on a trajectory to get me to where I'm at today. I lived with them for a year, but all that other time, it was up to me to make the decision not to look back. Mm -hmm. And today I get to travel the country and share my story. What God has done for me, he'll do for you as well. Oh, hallelujah. I can, I feel that. Listen, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans that I have for you. Thus saith the Lord, that is to give you a future and a hope. And I want you to know that word plans. It means that God has designs over your life. And if you feel him tugging on the strings of your heart right now, and you can really feel the presence of God pulling you out of a lifestyle that you know, deep down in your heart, that's not God's will for your life, that God has another plan. He has designs. He has purpose for your life. Just like with Janet, he has Mm -hmm. transformed her from the inside out. And now he has given you, the Lord has given you a platform on the very thing that the enemy tried to destroy you with. That's what our God Mm -hmm. does. He Mm -hmm. will turn everything around for your good. He will put people in your life. I love what Janet said. She sat down and she said, my name is Janet. I've been living a homosexual lifestyle, but I want to change. If you will work with me, if you will help me. And what she did, she got all of that darkness out of her by revealing the pain, revealing the struggle and bringing it to the light And that's where the deliverance came and her freedom came. And then God began to put people in her life. And I want you to know, he'll do the same thing for you too. This has been so powerful, um, Janet. Thank you so much for joining us again. One more time. Can you just give um, our listeners your um, information on how they can reach out to you? Maybe they want to, they want you to be their mentor or your, your ministry. They want to contact you and they need to get these books. How can they get them again? Yes, you can go to my website, www.JanetBoingsBoyingsMinistries.com. I would love to be everybody's mentors. Believe me, my door has been <laughs> being knocked down, you know, but I will do and make sure my team will do everything we can to assist and help you. So reach out to us because, you know, God loves you. And I'm just tired of the enemy lying to people that, you know, God doesn't love you or you're not capable. Look, I'm the least likely person to be doing what I'm doing. There's so many people out there smarter than me, but God chose me. The Bible says he'll take the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Mm. And God will choose you just like he chose me. You're Mm. not a misfit. You're very special. Thank you so much. Do you mind praying over that one person? Maybe there's a, a teenage girl or there's a man. You have really ministered to them. Can you just pray over them right now? Yeah. Father, we just thank you for this time that we have. And those that are out there listening to Jenna and I have this conversation. Lord, I know you're working on their heart. We just pray that, one, their heart is drawn to you, that they'll find a good Bible-based church that's near their house. Lord, that they could be able to go in and hopefully get the help that they need. But most importantly, Lord, that they will reach out to somebody who will love them and do everything that they can to assist them. Lord, we thank you for the the hearts that are open, the minds um, that are going to be changed from going out to that life. And Lord, we believe transformation is going to happen through the power of Jesus Christ. In your name, amen. 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 Thank you so much, Janet. I really appreciate you you doing that. Thank you guys for listening to One Voice Makes a Difference podcast. Like I said, please share this, get this out. And um, 
let the word of God change somebody by the word of Janet's testimony and all of our testimonies. We're changing and making a difference in people's lives, one voice at a time. So thank you for joining us. I'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you for listening to One Voice Makes a Difference. It is our prayer that through this episode, God has given you a new hope and inspiration to come out of darkness, break the silence, and tell somebody so His light and healing power may begin working in you. If you would like to connect with Janet, visit her website at janetswanson.org. Finally, if you are currently in crisis, please call the 24-7 Crisis Hotline at 1-800-273-8255 or visit suicidepreventionlifeline.org. Don't hesitate. Your voice and your life matters.